Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Megan Ann, Trisha, Lucy, Kurt, Spencer, and Aaron. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us cover the costs of recording, production, and distribution while keeping us 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you're interested in learning about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive episodes heard nowhere else, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com, where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight we're relaxing with a work recommended by one of your fellow listeners, and it's a book that proves that the wish to escape the pressures of modern life and run away to the country is not a new idea at all. We're reading Ten Acres Enough, A Practical Experience, showing how a very small farm may be made to keep a very large family with extensive and profitable experience in the cultivation of the smaller fruits. By Edmund Morris, 8th edition, published in 1866 by James Miller, New York City, and entered according to Act of Congress in the year 1864 by James Miller in the clerk's office of the District Court of the United States for the Southern District of New York. Let's begin. Preface The man who feeds his cattle on a thousand hills may possibly see the title of this little volume paraded through the newspapers, but the chances are that he will never think it worthwhile to look into the volume itself. The owner of a hundred acres will scarcely step out of his way to purchase or to borrow it, while the lord of every smaller farm will be sure it is not intended for him. Few persons belonging to these several classes have been educated to believe ten acres enough. Born to greater ambition, they have aimed higher and grasped at more, sometimes wisely, sometimes not. Many of these are now owning or cultivating more land than their heads or purses enable them to manage properly. Had their ambition been moderate and their ideas more practical, their labor would be better rewarded. And this book, without doubt, would have found more readers. The mistaken ambition for owning twice as much land as one can thoroughly manure or profitably cultivate is the great agricultural sin of this country. Those who commit it by beginning wrong too frequently continue wrong. Owning many acres is the sole idea. High cultivation of a small tract is one of which they have little knowledge. Too many in these several classes think they know enough. They measure a man's knowledge by the number of his acres. Hence, in their eyes, the owner of a plot so humble as mine must know so little as to be unable to teach them anything new. Happily, 
It is not for these that I write, and hence it would be unreasonable to expect them to become readers. I write more particularly for those who have not been brought up as farmers, for that numerous body of patient toilers in city, town, and village, who, like myself, have struggled on from year to year, anxious to break away from the bondage of the desk, the counter, or the workshop, to realize in the country even a moderate income, so that it be a sure one. Many such are constantly looking round in this direction for something which, with less mental toil and anxiety, will provide a maintenance for a growing family and afford a refuge for advancing age, some safe and quiet harbor, sheltered from the constantly recurring monetary and political convulsions, which in this country so suddenly reduce men to poverty. But these inquirers find no experienced pioneers to lead the way, and they turn back upon themselves, too fearful to go forward alone. Books of personal experience like this are rare. This is written for the information of the class referred to, for men not only willing but anxious to learn. Once in the same predicament myself, I know their longings, their deficiencies, and the steps they ought to take. Hence, in seeking to make myself fully understood, some may think that I have been unnecessarily minute. But in setting forth my own crudities, I do but save others from repeating them. Yet with all this amplification, my little contribution will occasion no crowding, even upon a bookshelf which may be already filled. I am too new a farmer to be the originator of all the ideas which are here set forth. Some, which seem to be appropriate to the topic in hand, have been incorporated with the argument as it progressed, while in some instances, even the language of writers, whose names were unknown to me, has also been adopted. Ten Acres Enough Chapter 1 City Experiences Moderate Expectations My life, up to the age of forty, has been spent in my native city of Philadelphia. Like thousands of others before me, I began the world without a dollar, and with very few friends in a condition to assist me. Having saved a few hundred dollars by dint of close application to business and avoiding taverns, oyster houses, theaters, and fashionable tailors, I married and went into business the same year. These two contemporaneous drafts upon my little capital, proving heavier than I expected, they soon used it up leaving me thereafter greatly straitened for means. It is true my business kept me, but as it was constantly expanding, and was of such a nature that a large proportion of my annual gain was necessarily invested in tools, fixtures, and machinery, I was nearly always short of ready cash to carry on my operations with comfort. At certain times also, it ceased to be profitable. The crisis of 1837 nearly ruined me, and I was kept struggling along during the five succeeding years of hard times, until the revival of 1842 came round. Previous to this crisis, necessity had driven me to the banks for discounts, one of the sore evils of doing business upon insufficient capital. As is always the case with these institutions, they compelled me to return the borrowed money at the very time it was least convenient for me to do so. 
they needed it as urgently as myself. But to refund them, I was compelled to borrow elsewhere, and that too at excessive rates of interest, thus increasing the burden while laboring to shake it off. Thousands have gone through the same unhappy experience and been crushed by the load. Such can anticipate my trials and privations. Yet I was not insolvent. My property had cost me far more than I owed, yet if offered for sale at a time when the whole community seemed to want money only, no one could have been found to give cost. I could not use it as the basis of a loan. Neither could I part with it without abandoning my business. Hence I struggled on through that exhausting crisis, haunted by perpetual fears of being dishonored at the bank, lying down at night not to peaceful slumber, but to dream of fresh expedients to preserve my credit for tomorrow. I have sometimes thought that the pecuniary cares of that struggle were severe enough to have shortened my life had they been much longer protracted. Besides the mental anxieties they occasioned, they compelled a pinching economy in my family. But in this latter effort, I discovered my wife to be a jewel of priceless value coming up heroically to the task, and relieving me of a world of care. Without her aid, her skill, her management, her uncomplaining cheerfulness, her sympathy in struggles so inadequately rewarded as mine were, I should have sunk into utter bankruptcy. Her economy was not the mean, penny-wise, pound-foolish policy, which many mistake for true economy. It was the art of calculation joined to the habit of order, and the power of proportioning our wishes to the means of gratifying them. The little pilfering temper of a wife is despicable and odious to every man of sense but there is a judicious, graceful economy which has no connection with an avaricious temper and which, as it depends upon the understanding, can be expected only from cultivated minds. Women who have been well educated, far from despising domestic duties, will hold them in high respect because they will see that the whole happiness of life is made up of the happiness of each particular day and hour, and that much of the enjoyment of these must depend upon the punctual practice of virtues which are more valuable than splendid. If I survived that crisis, it was owing to my wife's admirable management of my household expenses. She saw that our embarrassment was due to no imprudence or neglect of mine. She thus consented to severe privations, uttering no complaint, hinting no reproach, never disheartened, and so rarely out of humor that she never failed to welcome my return with a smile. But in this country... One convulsion follows another with disheartening frequency. I lived through that of 1837, paid my debts, and had managed to save some money. My wife's system of economy had been so long adhered to that in the end it became to some extent habitual to her, and she still continued to practice great frugality. I became insensibly accustomed to it myself. Children were multiplying around us, and we thought our skies had brightened for all future time. When in difficulty, we had often debated the propriety of quitting the city and its terrible business trials, and settling on a few acres in the country where we could raise our own food and spend the remainder of our days in cultivating ground 
which would be sure to yield us at least a respectable subsistence. We had no longing for excessive wealth. A mere competency, though earned by daily toil, so that it was reasonably sure and free from the drag of continued indebtedness to others, was all we coveted. I had always loved the country, but my wife preferred the city. I could take no step but such as would be likely to promote her happiness. So long as times continued fair, we ceased to canvass the propriety of a removal. We had children to educate, and to her the city seemed the best and most convenient place for qualifying them for future usefulness. Then most of our relations resided near us. Our habits were eminently social. We had made numerous friends, and among our neighbors there had turned up many valuable families. We felt even the thought of breaking away from all these cordial ties to be a trying one, but the refuge of a removal to the country had taken strong hold of my mind. Indeed, it may be said that I was born with a passion for living on a farm. It was fixed and strengthened by my long experience of the business vicissitudes of city life. For many years I had been a constant subscriber for several agricultural journals, whose contents I read as carefully as I did those of the daily papers. My wife also, being a great reader, came in time to study them almost as attentively. Everything I saw in them only tended to confirm my longing for the country, while they gave definite views of what kind of farming I was fit for. In fact, they educated me for the position before I assumed it. I am sure they exercised a powerful influence in removing most of my wife's objections to living in the country. I studied their contents as carefully as did the writers who prepared them. I watched the reports of crops, of experiments, and of profits. The leading idea in my mind was this, that a man of ordinary industry and intelligence, by choosing a proper location, within hourly reach of a great city market, could so cultivate a few acres as to ensure a maintenance for his family, free from the ruinous vibrations of trade or commerce in the metropolis. All my reading served to convince me of its soundness. I did not assume that he could get rich on the few acres which I ever expected to owe, but I felt assured that he could place himself above want. I knew that his peace of mind would be sure. With me, this was dearer than all. My reading had satisfied me that such a man would find ten acres enough, and these I could certainly command. As I did not contemplate undertaking the management of a large grain farm, so my studies did not run in that direction. Yet I read everything that came before me in relation to such, and not without profit. But I graduated my views to my means, and so noted with the utmost care the experiences of the small cultivators who farmed five to ten acres thoroughly. I noted their failures as watchfully as their successes, knowing that the former were to be avoided as the latter were to be imitated. As opportunity offered, I made repeated excursions year after year in every direction around Philadelphia, visiting the small farmers or truckers who supplied the city market with fruit and vegetables, examining, inquiring, and treasuring up all that I saw and heard. The fund of knowledge thus acquired 
was not only prodigious, but it has been of lasting value to me in my subsequent operations. I found multitudes of truckers who were raising large families on five acres of ground, while others owning only thirty acres had become rich. On most of these numerous excursions, I was careful to have my wife with me. I wanted her to see and hear for herself, and by convincing her judgment, to overcome her evidently diminishing reluctance to leaving the city. My uniform consideration for her comfort at last secured the object I had in view. She saw so many homes in which a quiet abundance was found, so many contented men and women, so many robust and bouncing children, that long before I was ready to leave the city, she was quite impatient to be gone. Chapter 2 Practical Views Safety of Investments in Land There was not a particle of romance in my aspirations for a farm. Neither had I formed a single visionary theory which was there to be tested. My notions were all sober and prosaic. I had struggled all my life for dollars, because abundance of them produces pecuniary comfort, and the change to country life was to be, in reality, a mere continuation of the struggle. But lightened by the assurance that if the dollars thus to be acquired were fewer in number, the certainty of earning enough of them was likely to be greater. Crops might fail under skies at one time too watery, at another too brassy, but no such disaster could equal those to which commercial pursuits are uninterruptedly exposed. They have brassy skies above them as well as farmers. For nearly twenty years, I had been hampered with having notes of my own or of other parties to pay, but of all the farmers I had visited, only one had ever given a note, and he had made a vow never to give another. My wife was shrewd enough to observe and remark on this fact at the time. It was so different from my own experience. She admitted there must be some satisfaction in carrying on a business which did not require the giving of notes. Looking at the matter of removal to the country in a practical light, I found that in the city I was paying three hundred dollars per annum rent for a dwelling house. It was the interest of five thousand dollars, yet it afforded nothing but a shelter for my family. I might continue to pay that rent for fifty years without, at the end of that time, having acquired the ownership of either a stone upon the chimney or a shingle in the roof. If the house rose in value, the rise would be to the owner's benefit, not to mine. It would really be injurious to me as the rise would lead him to demand an increase of his rent. But put the value of the house into a farm, or even the half of it. The farm would have a dwelling house upon it, in which my family would find as good a shelter, while the land, if cultivated as industriously as I had always cultivated business, would belie the flood of evidence I had been studying for many years, if it failed to yield to my efforts the returns which it was manifestly returning to others, we could live contentedly on a thousand dollars a year, and here we should have no landlord to pay. My wife, in pinching times, had financiered us through the year on several hundred less. I confess to having lived as well on the diminished rations as I wanted to, Indeed, until one tries it for himself, it is incredible what dignity there is in an old hat, what virtue in a time-worn coat, 
and how savory the dinner table can be made without sirloin steaks or cranberry tarts. Thus, let it be remembered, my views and aspirations had no tinge of extravagance. My rule was moderation. The tortures of a city struggle without capital had sobered me down to being contented with a bare competency. I might fail in some particulars at the outset from ignorance, but I was in the prime of life, strong, active, industrious, and tractable, and what I did not know I could soon learn from others, for farmers have no secrets. Then I had seen too much of the uncertainty of banks and stocks and ledger accounts and promissory notes to be willing to invest anything in either as a permanency. At best, they are fluctuating and uncertain, up to day and down tomorrow. My great preference had always been for land. More than once had I seen the values of all city property, improved and unimproved, apparently disappear. Lots without purchasers and houses without tenants. The community so poor and panic-stricken that real estate became the merest drug. Yesterday, the collapse was caused by the destruction of the National Bank. Today, it is the tariff. Sheriffs played havoc with houses and lands encumbered by mortgages, and lawyers fattened on the rich harvest of fees inaugurated by a bankrupt law. But those who, undismayed by the wreck around them, courageously held on to land, came through in safety. The storm, having run its course and exhausted its wrath, gave place to skies commercially serene, and real estate swung back with an irrepressible momentum to its former value, only to keep on advancing to one even greater. I became convinced that safety lay in the ownership of land. In all my inquiries, both before leaving the city as well as since, I rarely heard of a farmer becoming insolvent. When I did, and was careful to ascertain the cause, it turned out that he had either begun in debt and was thus hampered at the beginning or had made bad bargains and speculations outside of his calling, or wasted his means in riotous living, or had in some way utterly neglected his business. If not made rich by heavy crops, I could find none who had been made poor by bad ones. The reader may look back on every monetary convulsion he may be able to remember, and he will find that in all of them, the agricultural community came through with less disaster than any other interest. Wheat grows and corn ripens, though all the banks in the world may break, for seed time and harvest is one of the divine promises to man, never to be broken because of its divine origin. They grew and ripened before banks were invented, and will continue to do so when banks and railroad bonds shall have become obsolete. Moreover, the earthly fund for whose acquisition we are all striving, we naturally desire to make a permanent one. As we have worked for it, so we trust that it will work for us and our children. Its value, whatever that may be, depends on its perpetuity, the continuance of its existence. A man seeks to earn what will support and serve not only himself but his posterity. He would naturally desire to have the estate descend to children and grandchildren. This is one great object of his toil. 
What then is the safest fund in which to invest in this country? What is the only fund which the experience of the last fifty years has shown, with very few exceptions, would be absolutely safe as a provision for heirs? How many men within that period, assuming to act as trustees for estates, have kept the trust fund invested in stocks, and when distributing the principal among the heirs, have found that most of it had vanished. Under corporate insolvency, it had melted into air. No prudent man, accepting such a trust, and guaranteeing its integrity, would invest the fund in stocks. Our country is filled with pecuniary wrecks from causes like this. Thousands trust themselves during their lifetime to manage this description of property, confident of their caution and sagacity. With close watching and good luck, they may be equal to the task. But the question still occurs as to the probable duration of such a fund in families. What is its safety when invested in the current stocks of the country? And next, what is its safety in the hands of heirs? There are no statistics showing the probable continuance of estates in land in families, and of estates composed of personal property such as stocks. But every bank cashier will testify to one remarkable fact, that an heir no sooner inherits stock in the bank then the first thing he generally does is to sell and transfer it, and that such sale is most frequently the first notice given of the holder's death. This preference for investment in real estate will doubtless be objected to by the young and dashing businessmen, but lands, or a fund secured by real estate, is unquestionably not only the highest security, but in the hands of heirs it is the only one likely to survive a single generation. Hence the wisdom of the common law, which neither permits the guardian to sell the lands of his ward, nor even the court in its discretion, to grant authority for their sale, except upon sufficient grounds shown, as a necessity for raising a fund for the support and education of the ward. Even a Lord Chancellor can only touch so sacred a fund for this or similar reasons. The common law is wise on this subject, as on most others. It is thus the experience and observation of mankind that such a fund is the safest and hence the provisions of the law. Those, therefore, who acquire personal property, acquire only what will last about a generation, longer or shorter. Such property is quickly converted into money, it perishes and is gone, but land is hedged round with numerous guards which protect it from hasty spoliation. It is not so easily transferred. It is not so secretly transferred. The law enjoins deliberate formalities before it can be alienated, and often the consent of various parties is necessary. When all other guards give way, early memories of parental attachment to these ancestral acres, or tender reminiscences of childhood, will come in to stay the spoliation of the homestead, and make even the prodigal pause before giving up this portion of his inheritance. Throughout Europe, a passion to become the owner of land is universal, while the difficulty of gratifying it is infinitely greater than with us. It is there enormously dear, here it is absurdly cheap. It is from this universal passion 
that the vast annual immigration to this country derives its mighty impulse. As it reaches our shores, it spreads itself over the country in search of cheap land. Many of the most flourishing western states have been built up by the astonishing influx of immigrants. In England, every landowner is prompt to secure every freehold near him be it large or small, as it comes into market. Hence the number of freeholders in that country is annually diminishing by this process of absorption. This European passion for acquiring land is strangely contrasted with the American passion for parting with it. Chapter 3 Resolve to Go Escape from business, choosing a location. The last thirty years have been prolific of great pecuniary convulsions. I need not recapitulate them here, as too many of them are yet dark spots on the memory of some who will read this. Their frequency, as well as their recurrence at shorter intervals than at the beginning of the century, are among their most remarkable features, baffling the calculations of older heads and confounding those of younger ones. As the century advanced, these convulsions increased in number and violence. The whole business horizon seemed full of coming storms, which burst successively with desolating severity not only on merchants and manufacturers, but on others who had long before retired from business. No one could foresee this state of things. I will not stop to argue causes, but confine myself to facts which none will care to contradict. These disasters made beggars of thousands in every branch of business, and spread discouragement over every community. I passed through several of them, striving and struggling, and oppressed beyond all power of description. How many more the community was to encounter, I did not know, but I conceived it the part of prudence to place myself beyond the circle of their influence before I also had been prostrated. In spite of the losses thus encountered, I had been saving something annually for several years, when the stricture of 1854 came on, premonitory of the tremendous crash of 1857. Most unfortunately for my comfort, that stricture seemed to fall with peculiar severity on a class of dealers largely indebted to me. Many of them became embarrassed and failed to pay me at the time, while to this day some of them are still my debtors. My old experiences of raising money revived, and to some extent I was compelled to go through the humiliations of similar periods. But the stricture was of brief duration, and I closed the year in far better condition than I had anticipated. But the trials of that incipient crisis determined me to abandon the city. I found that by realizing all I then possessed, I could command means enough to purchase ten to twenty acres, and I had grown nervous and apprehensive of the future. While possessed of a little, I resolved to make that little sure by investing it in land. I had worked for the landlord long enough. My excellent wife was now entirely willing to make the change, and our six children clapped their hands with joy when they heard that father was going to live in the country. I had long determined in my mind what sort of farming was likely to prove profitable enough to keep us with comfort, and that was the raising of small fruits for the city markets. 
my attention had always been particularly directed to the berries. Some strawberries I had raised in my city garden with prodigious success. My friends, when they heard of my project, expressed fears that the market would soon be glutted, not exactly by the crops which I was to raise, but they could not exactly answer how. They confessed that they were extremely fond of berries, and that at no time in the season could they afford to eat enough, a confession which seemed to explode all apprehension of the market being overstocked. But my wife and myself had both examined the hucksters who called at the door with small fruits, as to the monstrous prices they demanded, and had begged them if ever a glut occurred, that they would call and let us know. But none had ever called with such information. It was the same thing with those who occupied stalls in the various city markets. They rarely had a surplus left unsold, and their prices were always high. A glut of fruit was a thing almost unknown to them. It was a safe presumption that the market would not be depressed by the quantity that I might raise. But here, let me say something by way of parenthesis, touching this common idea of the danger of overstocking the fruit market of a great city. It is a curious fact that this idea is entertained only by those who are not fruit growers. The latter never harbored it. Their whole experience runs the other way. They know it to be a gross absurdity. Yet, somehow, the question of a glut has always been debated. Twenty years ago, the nurserymen were advised to close up their sales and abandon the business, as they would soon have no customers for trees. Everybody was supplied. But trees have continued to be planted from that day to this. And where hundreds were sold twenty years ago, thousands are disposed of now. Old established nurseries have been trebled in size, while countless new ones have been planted. The nursery business has grown to a magnitude truly gigantic, because the market for fruit has been annually growing larger, and no business enlarges itself unless it has proved to be profitable. The market cannot be glutted with good fruit. The multiplication of mouths to consume it is far more rapid than the increase of any supply that growers can affect. Within ten years, the masses have had a slight taste of choice fruits, and but little more. Indulgence has only served to whet their appetites. The more of them there is offered in the market, the more will there be consumed. Every huckster in her shamble, every vendor of peanuts in the street, will testify to this. The modern art of semi-cookery for fruit, and of preserving it in cans and jars, has made sale for enormous quantities of those choicer kinds which return the highest profit to the grower. It is in the grain market that panic often rages, but never in the fruit market. If it ever enters the latter, the struggle is to obtain the fruit, not to get rid of it. The proper choice of a location was now to be the great question of my future success. I had determined on giving my attention to the raising of the smaller fruits for the great markets of New York and Philadelphia. I must therefore be somewhere on or near the railroad between those cities, and as near as possible to a station. The soil of Pennsylvania near Philadelphia was too heavy for some of the lighter fruits. New Jersey, with its admirable sandy loam, light, warm, and of surprisingly easy tillage, 
was proverbially adapted for the growth of all market produce, whether fruit or vegetable, and was at the same time a week or two earlier. Land was far cheaper. There was no state debt. Taxes were merely nominal, and an acre that could be bought for $30 could be made four times as productive as an acre of the best wheat land in Pennsylvania. Such results are regularly realized by hundreds of Jerseymen from year to year. Every town within the range of my wants was well supplied with churches, schools, and stores, together with an intelligent and moral population. I should be surrounded by desirable neighbors, while an hour's ride by steamboat or railroad would place me many times daily among all my ancient friends in the city. We should by no means become hermits. I knew the country so well from my numerous visits among the fruit growers when in search of information as to anticipate but little difficulty in finding the proper location. By the mere accident of a slight revival in business in the early part of 1855, a party came along who was thus induced to purchase my stock and machinery. Luckily, he was able to pay down the whole amount in cash. I received what I considered at the time an excellent price. But when I came to settle up my accounts and pay what I owed, I found to my extreme disappointment that but a little over $2,000 remained. This sum was the net gain of many years of most laborious toil. Was it possible for farming to be a worse business than this? I had made ten times as much, but my losses had been terrible. This, with my personal credit, was all the surplus I had saved. I remember now that when thus discovering myself to be worth so little, I half regretted having given up my business for what then appeared to me so inadequate a sum. When selling, I was jubilant and thankful. When settled up, I was full of regret. I ought to have had more. So difficult is it for the human mind to be satisfied with that which is really best. But I little knew what the future was to bring forth and how soon my want of thankfulness was to be changed into the profoundest conviction that I had providentially escaped from total ruin and come out comparatively rich. I had made myself snug upon my little farm when the tornado of 1857 toppled my former establishment into utter ruin. My successor was made a bankrupt, and his business was destroyed, leaving him overwhelmed with debt. He had lost all, while I had saved all. Had I not sold when I did and secured what the sale yielded me, I too should have been among the wrecks of that terrific visitation." but I heard its warring in the quiet of my little farmhouse, where it brought me neither anxiety nor loss. My position was like that of one sitting peacefully by his wintry fireside, gazing on the thick storm without, and listening to the patter of the snowflakes as the tempest drove them angrily against the window pane, while all within was calm and genial. Instead of regrets for what I had failed to grasp, my heart overflowed with thankfulness for the comparative abundance that remained to me. My peace of mind was perfect. The unspeakable satisfaction was felt of being out of business, out of debt, out of danger, not rich, but possessed of enough. 
the thoughtful reader may well believe that subsequent disturbances, rebellion, war, and even a more widespread bankruptcy, from all which my humble position made me secure, have only served to intensify my gratitude to that divine providence which so mercifully shaped my ways. And with that hopeful conclusion to chapter three, I think we'll end this evening's reading from Ten Acres Enough by Edmund Morris. I don't know about you, but that fantasy of a simple country life enters my mind from time to time, even though I know it's ridiculous. And I look forward to reading more about Mr. Morris's experiences. If you'd like to read this work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>